centuries, um, Chicano and Latino art history, pre-Columbian art history. Um, at the department, Holly is also associate chair and director of graduate studies. Um, Holly's uh, work um, in the pre-Columbian uh, era um, led to her dissertation and continued work. Um, her dissertation was uh, named The Necessity of Pre-Columbian Art, U.S. Museums and the Role of Foreign Policy in the Appropriation and Transformation of Mexican Heritage, 1933-1945. Um, Holly is also the recipient of many awards, um, including a Rockefeller Foundation Residency Fellowship in Bellagio, Italy. I'm practicing in Italian all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and her work there uh, revolved around Latin American and Chicano art criticism since the 1940s between modernity and globalization. She was also co-project coordinator and member of the National Selection Committee 1986 to 1990, um, who, uh, well, it was a, uh, Curate, curatorial committee, correct? Yeah. And um, they uh, were responsible for the Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation, a national interpretive exhibition of Chicano Art, of Chicano Art Movement. Um, she's also the author of Where Are the Chicana Printmakers? Presence and Absence in the Art of Chicana Artists in the Movimiento, in Just Another Poster, Chicano Graphic Arts in California, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara University Art Museum. And she's also the co-editor and co-author of the introduction with Eva Cockcroft, um, Signs from the Heart, California, California Chicano Murals, Venice, California, um, published by the Social and Public Arts Res Resource Center. Um, and uh, I am very pleased to uh, welcome Holly Burnett Sanchez, and please help me. positioned 
in um, most of the world. They are absolutely central to the Hispano, Hispana, Chicano, Chicana, Latino, Latina experience. Um, so it really is about art-based community making. We have been raised to be analytical and critical as scholars. I was the professor who cried. <laughs> this is emotional for me because with the movement here in New Mexico, in California, in Texas, in Colorado, and elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest, people died to be visible. People died to have a claim to what was theirs. And the art is filled with passion. So our job as professors, whether it's about the yes, Asec Yes, which that was a moving presentation. The most moving concept to me was the idea of sharing scarcity. That's really a remarkable. And I think the difference between Georgia O'Keeffe and Maria Hesch is the emptiness of Georgia O'Keeffe's where there is no sharing. And Maria Hesch shares. There's engagement and disengagement. And Georgia O'Keeffe's work is magnificent. But it's a different, she came here to disengage. The Hispano, Hispana community is engaged for hundreds of years. So in our curriculum, in what we teach and what we bring to our students is, is the passion about what we do and the passion about the culture. I received a very poignant email about two years ago from a former student from when I first taught here. I think she was in the same Chicano class you were in. And she went on to law school. She's now a lawyer. She's a public defender. And it was a very point, she was so sad. She said, I'm sitting here in the middle of the justice system. And all my hermanos and hermanitas are going through this justice system. They're ending up in prison. That what they need, what they needed, was to see themselves in the classroom. So she's very pleased that we're teaching it at the college level. And it made a big difference to her, the class she took with me. But we need it in K through 12. We need it, we need presence, not just absence. Um, Brenda Romero's talk on the Matachines was wonderful. And it articulated to me the what Marcos Martinez said about everything starting with the body. Because you could see Brenda in that video where she'd been up all night and the camera was moving. You could hear her violin playing. And in the work of Miguel Yander, Chicago, um, by embracing the mes 
the psyche that is both real and romanticized, essentialized and dialectical. And I think in, in New Mexico, there certainly are Chicanos here, people who identify as Chicanos, but I think the, the concept that Miguel has put forward, the Indo-Hispano, that is a form of very real, as well as romanticized, um, mestizaje. Yesterday, when we were talking about some of the myths, et cetera, or the, the miracles, looking at it from more the Hispano side, um, there is um, the idea also um, from, with the, with the Chicano experience, of embracing, uh, during the movimiento era, of embracing the indio in oneself. And David Avalos, an artist in the border uh, in uh, San Diego, used to talk about how during the movimiento, we learned to love our indio side that had been reviled. And he said, but then we, we hated the Spaniards. We hated them for conquering the indio. And he said, but you know, half of me is Spanish. So that means I still hate myself. <laughs> so now what am I going to do? Well, a lot of this is internalized hatred imposed upon us, or imposed upon Mexican Americans, oh, Chicanos, Hispanos, etc. A cartoon of Manifest Destiny. Uh, Uncle Sam being fit for a suit. Florida, Louisiana Purchase, Arizona, California, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado. Um, when I talk about Mexico having lost half its territory to the United States, and we're in it, um, students are, are kind of shocked that, you know, this, what we call the U.S. Southwest is, is formerly Mexico. Uh, next, please. And in the United States, this is how Latin America, one way Latin America has been perceived as recalcitrant children, uh, particularly Mexico. Um, and that wonderful phrase, that horribly wonderful, awful phrase, poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. Uh, next, please. And here you have Lindbergh marrying uh, the lovely senorita Mexico to Uncle Sam, the young woman and the older man. And Mexico and Mexico's children on this side of the border now have been seen as children or uh, feminized, uh, infantilized. And um, so what does this mean when um, a, a generation of people come together and say, we appreciate what our elders did. They went from being called S Spanish to being called Mexican American with a hyphen, and that was a big move. But we're something different. And we're something different on a national basis. And part of that started here in New Mexico with the land grant movement and with a lot of other people. Well, there are many definitions of what a Chicano is, and this is one of the few times I can give several of those definitions to a Chicano audience. That's really exciting. Uh, what um, Santos Martinez, an artist from Texas and Minnesota, how's that for a combination, uh, uh, in 1970, uh, uh, Chicano is a politicized Mexican American. Ruben Salazar, the journalist who was killed in the moratorium march on August 29, 1970. A Mexican-American, he, he forgot about women, it was 1970. A Mexican-American is, uh, a Chicano is a Mexican-American with a non-Anglo image of himself. Um, a junior college teacher told my former husband when he was Marcos was a Mexican who came when he was seven to the United States. He was in junior college at East LA, 1970, and he was very assimilationist. If you heard his voice and did not see him, you'd think he was any old Anglo you ever saw. He absolutely wiped himself out in terms of the way he spoke. 
growing up in East LA. So his teacher said, he said, Marcus said, are, are Chicanos Mexican Americans who whine all the time? And um, I must say that Marcus then became the president of Mecha there. But this teacher said, no, a Mexican American, uh, Chicano is a Mexican American who's had it up to here. Culture Clash, the Chicano uh, comedy group, as recently as 1994 or 5 in their glossary said, under the term Chicano, we're still trying to figure that one out. So what do these terms mean? They mean different things, different times, different places. Um, Curtis's observation yesterday that many people, uh, that, um, and many people followed up on it, was a sobering one after uh, Tay's talk. That we are in a time where people are invested in not being persuaded. And I'm paraphrasing you, I'm not sure how well. That it's, it's very difficult to see the validity of another person's perspective. We seem to be in a time of either or, not ever both and. We've lost the idea of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And I think the Hispano, Indo, Hispano, Chicano, Latino experience is, is one of those places where we can go back and see where real synthesis, real difference, with being, where it's both and, the possibility of both and is still there. And I think the work of the artists, the Chicana artists, the Chicano artists and writers uh, emphasize that. And one of the things they do is to contradict this idea um, that uh, uh, was quoted from uh, Benjamin and uh, via Susan Bachmoras, seize hold of a memory at a moment of historical danger or even the dead will not be safe. Fanon said it also in The Wretched of the Earth. Colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content by a kind of perverted logic. It turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. This work of devaluing pre-colonial or even present history takes a dialectical significance today. So one of the things that we have here, talk about treasures, talk about heroes, uh, we have, with Tay's work, look at the title of her book. Sin nombre. Without name. Look what her mother has done. Margaret Montoya statement. What do we do when we are the first? The first Latina in law school, the first law professor, the first curator, the first college graduate in our family? Well, I'm going to have to quote for myself. <laughs> it's fun. And that's the glory of being a teacher. And teaching is performance as well. Now, I was writing about Chicana printmakers in California, but I think what holds true is about Chicana artists everywhere. So I'm just going to do Chicana artists since the early 1970s have created a visual vocabulary that has helped to construct a Chicano identity in conjunction with the Chicano civil rights movement, or movimiento. Perhaps more significant are the multiple Chicano subjectivities they have created for themselves as individuals and for the multivalent Chicana communities to which the artists belong. What these women have in common with each other and with their Chicana sisters who write poetry and prose is the creation and presentation of themselves as women who have agency, as has been shown by Diana's talk today, who have voices and imagery that speak of themselves and each other as active beings responsible for the construction of identities that reflect their histories, their struggles with racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, ethnocentrism, against religious prejudice, 
against invisibility. They have, through their prints and posters and other works of art and their writing, created image, images of themselves and other women of color. They have constituted or reconstituted their identities as mestizas, bicultural, and bilingual, as women who are renegotiating, renegotiating their conceptual and physical presence and territories individually and collectively, redefining what women, womanness means in terms of self, family, and community. And the biggest thing about Chicano art is that it is a communal project. Murals, posters, paintings, everything. It, it's very much a collective process. In many instances, Chicano artists also reach beyond the specific needs of Chicano communities to coalition building with others, locally, regionally, and globally. They break open the stereotypes imposed upon them from both within and without and outside of Chicanismo. At times, their images don't directly reflect what could easily be labeled exclusively a Chicano experience, but rather deal with urban alienation, gender relations, or even sometimes a post-punk apocalyptic vision of threatened or actual psychic and physical, physical violence. Chicano artists working in other media also participate in the construction of visual vocabularies and subjectivities. Presence and absence can refer to a number of things. The presence of women as artists and the relevant absence of their work in exhibitions or talleres, workshops. The enormity of the impact of many of their works as Dad Hernandez has been called, for example, the most important artist of the Chicano movement because of her iconic images. I'm not proposing or uh, disagreeing with that. It's just been offered. Um, also, and the lack of acknowledgment for their contributions, the depiction of certain themes which are undervalued, such as the holiness of making tamales, for example, the daily lives, because they are not seen as representative of certain cultural nationalisms, the reconfiguration of woman in contrast to the kind of female in imagery made by Chicano artists. Alma notice, for example. What is excluded from Chicana art is often as telling as what is presence. present. Presence and absence when writing about the work of Chicana artists in the Chicano civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s could easily be an essay about numbers, about the difficulty of being an artist when one has responsibilities to one's family, as well, oh, the same as being a scholar, um, as well as to part-time or full-time jobs, about access to materials and equipment, about sexual discrimination in the movimiento, or about racism and sexism in the mainstream art world. Um, but what, 
What happens when it came to New York is in the skyline of New York City of 1940, it looks small. But one of the things that Chicanas have done is take on Las Diosas. And one of the things that I find very interesting is when they take on Las Dioses, Coatlicue, Coil Shauki, her daughter who killed her, uh, to keep the world from becoming patriarchal, from the god of war, Huitzilopochtli, from being born. She was not successful, but she was. She is the moon goddess. She can kill her brother every day. Um, and he can kill her every night. Um, but they take on these figures and transform them, as you have seen, in ways that men will not touch, Coatlicue, Coil Shauti, Malinche, La Llorona, La Virgen de Guadalupe, until very recently. They cannot be seen, particularly La Virgen, Coil Shauti, Coatlicue, like the Venus de Milo, as a sexualized female. And so these women, these Chicana artists, can take them on and reformulate them as real women of power. Um, so this is what we're seeing. And in the writing, the transformation, the sense of place, the sense of subversion, the sense of humor, the sense of groundedness, the sense of earthiness, the sense of the mystical is in this work. And it is very powerful. And I'm very grateful to people such as Tay, her mother, what a team. And <laughs> Teresa Marquez was also responsible for this, bringing back the words that have been relegated to invisibility. I would just like to close with a statement by Celia that I got sidetracked with. She said, and this is in regard to what Margaret said yesterday, we had no role model. We had no role models. How do you depict the face of a Chicana? Who were we? We had no role models. We weren't invisible. We did not exist. And so that first generation was a generation of true giving birth. 